Archbishop Dr. Dominique Bierman has traveled the world for over three decades, proclaiming the gospel made in Zion to the nations. She exposes the false doctrines of replacement theology and preaches restoration to the Jewish roots. Now join Archbishop Dominica in the latest Bible School on Wheels, exploring the entire land of Israel. So history remembers names that are defined, whether wicked or good. That's who history remembers. Abram, does history remember Abram? What defined Abram? What defined Abram to really come into covenant, a legal contract with the living Elohim? What defined him was Genesis 22. Genesis 22, Elohim told him, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him up as a burnt offering to me on Mount Moriah. That's what defined Abraham. Until that moment, Abraham was a good man. He was following the God of Israel, Yahweh, El Shaddai, the one that had given him all the promises. However, for Abraham to become the father of the nations, Abraham needed to become completely defined. And the only thing that would define Abraham was to offer the son whom he loved, that he believed for all the years of his life. And that only through that son he could multiply and become supposedly the father of the nations. So he was going to put on the altar every promise that Yahweh himself had given him. Everything was going on that altar. That means Abraham was saying, when I'm putting him on the altar, that means I'm going to have no future, no posterity, no blessing, nothing. What did he do? He took him. He took him and he put him on the altar and he meant business. He was defined. He grabbed that knife and he was going down to cut him into pieces because a burnt offering needed to be cut into pieces first and then you would put fire to the offering and then the aroma would go up to heaven and Elohim would smell that aroma and he would be pleased. That's a holocaust. That's the reason why I'm saying that to call the Shoah the Holocaust is calling the Shoah or the burning Jews in the gas chambers of the death camps a pleasing sacrifice with a sweet aroma to Yahweh. And therefore the name Holocaust is not the right name for that horrendous utter devastation that happened in Nazi Europe. It is the Shoah, which means utter devastation. Amen? The Bible can be summed up in one word restoration the restoration of man to god and a return to the truth of the hebrew scriptures as experienced by the disciples of yeshua the messiah after decades of teaching archbishop dr dominica bierman has published her first volume of restorative theology the original way builds on acts 321 where restoration precedes the return of the messiah you'll discover 27 chapters of eye-opening revelation of how the church has lost its original Jewish roots. You too can experience restorative theology through the original way. Bring the end time revival to your nation. Order your copy today. But you see, in Genesis 22, Abraham became so defined. And do you know how the God of Israel was called from that moment? Even the God of Israel got a name. You see, when we are walking in such a defined covenant relationship with the living God, with the living Yah, He even gets a special name in that covenant relationship. Like, for example, He could be called the God of Dominica Bierman. He's called the, Do He's called the God of Abraham. He's called the God of Isaac. He's called the God of Jacob. In other words, He becomes even Him. He gets the name 
of his own covenanted people. He's called the God of Israel. And in fact, he was also called the fear of Isaac. That's the name, Pachad Itzchak, the fear of Isaac. He was called the fear of Isaac. Why was he the fear of Isaac? Because when Isaac was lying there, do you think that maybe when he saw that knife coming down on him from his own father, he may have had some fear? <sighs> wow. Can't imagine what did he feel when he was up there on that altar. But the definition came in Genesis 22. Without that definition, you wouldn't be sitting here today. I would not be saved today. The people of Israel wouldn't exist anymore today. There wouldn't have been any Messiah born today. No salvation for the nations. The only thing that makes it to target is covenanted definition. Covenanted definition. It is a choice of a contract that should never be broken. And if it is never broken, it will make it to target. Ruth and Naomi was such a covenanted contract, a covenanted definition. She was defined. However, we are going to take a look at Ruth and Naomi later on when we take a look at her closer. And we're going to discover that Ruth and Naomi was first a unilateral covenant. It was not a covenant between Ruth and Naomi. When Ruth made the covenant, she did not require from <coughs> Naomi to give her back the same terms. She just said to Naomi, do not entreat me to leave you. Go to Ruth 1, 6 and 17. That I'm not, you know, reading directly from the Bible is okay. Aren't we supposed to be leaving epistles and have the Bible in here and the scriptures in here? Well, then I'm quoting to you verbatim what is written in there, but I'm quoting it to you. It says, do not entreat me to leave you. For wherever you go, I will go. Did Naomi tell her the same thing? No. Did the Naomi tell Ruth to not entreat me to leave you? No. And then she said, your Elohim will be my Elohim. Did she require Naomi to say the same to her? No. Unilateral. Your people, my people. She didn't require that Naomi would agree that Moab is the people of Israel. No, no. She didn't agree, no, it wasn't bilateral, it was unilateral, unilateral. And then it went on to say, and where you live, I will live. She didn't require Naomi to live where she lived, but she said she was going to live where Naomi lived. And then she said, where you die, I will die. Again, she didn't require this life and death commitment from Naomi. She gave Naomi an unconditional life and death commitment. That is a unilateral covenant, only one-sided. Elohim sometimes also makes unilateral covenant. Noah, when at the end, he says that he's making a covenant with the earth that as long as the earth exists, there will be a seed time and harvest. And he will not again destroy the earth with a flood. Now, that covenant didn't require that Noah would make that covenant with Elohim. Or that any humankind that will be there would make any covenant with it. It's a unilateral covenant with the earth. It's, it's a totally unconditional. It doesn't depend even on how we're going to be and how wicked man is going to be on the earth. Elohim said, I will not destroy the earth with a curse anymore. 
and I will forever allow seed time and harvest. When it's seed time and harvest means that there is always going to be food on the earth. Because if there is seed, then there is a harvest. And if there is a harvest, there is food. So it was always going to allow that man would have food to eat on the earth coming from the plant world. That's a unil unilateral covenant. Completely unilateral. However, the covenant with Abraham was not unilateral. No. The covenant with Abraham became bilateral. It was unilateral at first. When he came in Genesis 12 and he told him and he promised things to him. But before that covenant that Elohim called the shots on could actually come into effect... His vessel for the covenant to be fulfilled needed to become completely defined and covenanted with him by a legal contract that included blood. The blood of his own son. And when he came down with that knife and the angel said, wait, now I know that you love me because you have not withheld your son from me, your only son. Then I will fulfill with you everything that I have told you. And I'm going to paraphrase because it happened thousands of years later. Because you have not withheld your son from me, I will not withhold my son from you and from humanity. All this comes out of a, a covenant that first looks unilateral. Because the one that calls the shots on the covenant is not Abraham. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not so sure. Wait. The one that calls the shots on that covenant at first is not Abraham, is Elohim. Elohim tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, I will give you the land of Canaan as your inheritance, I will make your name great and in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed and you, you will be a great nation and you will be a... All this is Elohim calling the shots. Abraham has nothing to do with it. He's just telling him, this is what I'm going to do. But then for him to do it, he makes it depending on it to become bilateral. Now, when it becomes bilateral, the rules change. Now, when he didn't say, I'm going to do it regardless. No, I needed to test the father of the nations. I needed to test him that he was going to be defined. Because out of him and out of that definition, that covenant definition of that, that spiritual DNA, that covenant definition, I'm going to multiply him and I'm going to make him a father of the nations. I want that seed to be the right seed and I want that seed to multiply. I want that definition, that covenant definition, that covenant commitment, that I want multiplied. That I wanted to become the father of the nations, the one that will bring in the sheep nations eventually. I have read most of um, Archbishop Dominic Biemen's books, and one of the favorites is Healing Power of the Roots. And on its cover, you will see life or death. And it's a very uh, touching message. That's the part that took my attention because and I really wanted to read it all through. I couldn't put that book away. I read it all the way through and it really is life or death. Once we know the roots of the, our faith, we will understand what we are doing in life. If we don't really know where the roots of our faith are, then we are lost in the wilderness. And It's a very powerful book and I encourage anyone who can buy it to read it. And now back to Bible School on Wheels with Archbishop Dominica Bierman. So, when Abraham was willing, when it became defined, when Abraham responded, then the covenant became bilateral. Though Elohim is the one that called all of the shots, Abraham now bought himself through a legal contract of 
definition. He bound himself to Yahweh in such a form that now whatever Abraham would ask from Elohim, Elohim would give him. And now we can understand why in Genesis chapter 18, when he has the three angels appearing and he feeds them with goat meat and butter, so all those that say that we can need to separate between meat and milk, that is a rabbinical tradition, but not necessarily has nothing to do with the Torah. That's right. mm -hmm. It was just simply that we're not supposed to boil a kid in its mother's milk, which was a pagan rite for fertility. So technically, don't do that pagan rite. But to eat butter with a meat or meat with milk is not against the Torah. It's okay for those that want to be more rabbinical than the rabbis. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> okay. And so when these angels show up, three of them, and they talk to Abraham at the entrance of the tent, and then Elohim says, shall I hide from my friend Abraham what I'm going to do? For I know that he will teach his children to obey my covenant and to keep my commandments and my statutes and my precepts. And then he didn't hid from him the fact that he was about to send these angels to destroy Sodoma and Gomorrah because of the wickedness in those cities that included flagrant homosexuality. He didn't hide that fact. He told him what he was going to do. Abram had family there. Lot was um, Lot a covenanted person? No. Yes or no? no? Nope. Lot was in alliance with Abraham as long as his, it served his interest. If it didn't serve his interest, he was not there. And that's the difference between alliance and covenant too. That alliance is based on mutual interest. As long as it is mutually interesting to us to be together, we will be together, we will form an alliance. A covenant and definitive definition covenant and covenant definition is another ball game. Lot was not a covenant man. He was not covenanted with Abraham. He was covenanted with the God of Abraham, sort of. He believed in the God of Abraham, but he loved his own life and the things of this world much more than he loved the God of Abraham. And therefore he chose this area in the Jordan Valley, or the, you know, at the edge of the Jordan Valley, or the, the Kikara Yarden, which is uh, it, when the Jordan Valley now becomes the Dead Sea, okay? There is an air, that area was very, very beautiful, and it had a lot of vegetation and fruits and flowers, and he loved it and he liked it so much that he took all that area, though it was very wicked, but he took it. Then Abraham took all the rest, all the rest of the land of Canaan. But you see, because the moment that you become defined in your covenant allegiance, like Abraham was defined with Elohim, like Ruth was defined with Naomi. Notice that I've mentioned two very defined covenants. One is towards the Almighty, and one is between woman and woman, or human being to human being. I could show you other ones that are from human being to human being, like David and Jonathan. I could show you other ones as well. And of course, the covenant of marriage that happens uh, when people understand what the covenant of marriage really means, which would be another subject that's very important to understand what the covenant of marriage really means in this generation of divorce. And so, when he became defined in his covenant by obeying Yahweh to the uttermost, to the point of being willing to kill his own son and burn him to Elohim, wow. Then he became the friend of Elohim. Then he became his friend. And then in Genesis 18, 
when Elohim told him, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, we can see Abraham bartering with the Almighty. We can see him saying, but, but far it be from you, the judge of the whole earth, that you would destroy the righteous with the wicked. And what if there is 50 righteous there? And Elohim, being his friend, says, I will not destroy it for 50. So he was negotiating. This sounds like, you, you know, when you go to the market and you negotiate something that you're going to buy, and they tell you, well, it costs 100 shekels, and he says, what about if I give you 50? And he says, no, no, you need to give me 80. No, but I'll give you 40. No, but I'll give you 70. No. It's a Middle Eastern negotiation style right there. And he goes ahead and he tells him, and what about if there are 40? No, I will not destroy for 40. And what about if there are 30? No, I will not destroy. And what about if 20? And what about if 10? And when it came to 10, he stopped. He said, yes, I've gone towards you, Abraham, all the way, but 10 is my minimum Quorum, my minimum number by which I will not destroy a city. Remember that? Remember that? Ten is a minimum number. And it keeps on repeating itself like in Zechariah 8.23 when ten people of the different languages of the nations <coughs> grab a hold of the hem of the garment or the seat seat of him that is a Jew saying let us go with you because we've heard that Elohim is with you meaning mentor us teach us because holding the seat seat of someone is both saying okay I want I want to be under your protection and I want you to teach me I want you to mentor me and I want to be healed by what you're telling me so I'm making covenant with you Holding the tzitzit is another way of making covenant. I'm going to, we, we can talk about it some more. But we have come, therefore, to the point where Abraham could barter with the Almighty because he was defined in his covenant relationship. If we want to obtain anything from Yahweh, and it's also in John 15, you see, these things keep on repeating themselves from the Torah all the way to the New Covenant portion of scriptures. In John 15, what does it say? If you abide in me, my words abide in you, whatever you will ask, I will give you, I will do for you. And it says, if you do what I say, if you obey my commandment, I will not call you slaves, I will not call you servants anymore, I will call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what a master is doing, but the friend knows all things. What is he really telling us this morning? What do you think he's telling you this morning? I know what he has told me from the beginning, and it was that I can't be wishy-washy, that I need to be defined, and that my covenant needs to be defined with him. And with you all. You see, I'm covenanted with Elohim through the blood of Yeshua, but not only because Yeshua spilled his blood. Because Yeshua spilled his blood, but my response to him is all of me to you. All of me belongs to you. Whatever you tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Like Abraham did with his son Isaac. So I have a covenant with him, and that even sometimes has mandated me to forfeit the ones I love that maybe are not doing the will of the Father for those whom he loves that are doing the will of the Father. But I have a covenant with him and through him I have a covenant with you all and my covenant with you all has caused me to be standing with you here today and I told you that this last month I had enough of a reason not to be here today. Those that know what has happened to me this last month, you know that I have more than enough reasons not to be here today. I have more than enough reasons to have canceled the whole operation. Those that know, would you agree what I'm saying is true? Yes. And I'm not exaggerating one bit. But you know why I didn't? I didn't because I have a covenant with Yavir and I have a covenant with you. Because I knew that you were coming from the nations with hunger and thirst, paying a price to come to the land, to hear from Yah, to get instructed, to get strengthened, to get healed, to get delivered, and go back to your nations defined. Because I have a covenant with you too, and I want you therefore to see how you should do it so that you can walk exactly in the same way. So what is it telling us today? Because you see, this particular conference doesn't come at a time when things are plastic. 
They are coming when there are realities behind us. There are backgrounds that we're working with. In Israel, in your nations, for example, I know that I have Pastor Marcelo and Pastor Magali Corral here from Ecuador. And I know that, for example, their um, nation is in a state of emergency. And they grab the last planes they could grab out of there just to be here. And it's a miracle even that they could come out because this, the whole country is in a state of emergency. So there's a reality there. And they understood that in that reality, they better keep covenant with the living Yah that they need to be here because they are delegates of the United Nations for Israel. And he was elected to be a delegate again and he wasn't going to come because he came already before and they didn't have money for this time. The price was too high. And finally, when the state of emergency came, the price didn't become too high. You see, why do we need to wait for states of emergency to come in our lives to pay the price? Beloved ones, I'm going to tell you something. When we are defined, we are able to do everything Yahweh wants us to do. It doesn't depend on the money. It doesn't depend on the circumstances. It doesn't depend on nothing. And not even in your health. There's some people that come and they tell me, well, I didn't come because I wasn't feeling well. I'm saying, well, then you are not defined. Because even if you're not feeling well, but you know what's right to do, and you go do it even when you're not feeling well, you are going to make some miracle happen. Because only by that kind of a definition we can change the world. That's the reason why Hitler could change the world for the evil. That's the reason why those guys in Genesis 11 could have overtaken the third heavens and Elohim needed to come down because they were defined, they were committed, they were absolutely going to do it because of definition. Yahweh is telling us that if we do not become this defined, we are going to be nothing but a useless organization. I would like to talk about Unify the United Nations for Israel. I am proud to be a member of UNIFI and also one of the 70 righteous who support the United Nations for Israel. During the parade in Jerusalem, we had 12 nations that were marching with us. One man came up to me, he saw my flag, he thought we were all Americans. When I told him we were 12 nations here showing our love for Israel, it overwhelmed him and he almost started to cry. So I am proud to be part of a ministry and an organization that brings together the nations around this world to love and support and let Israel know that we stand with Israel. If you enjoyed today's program, we'd love to hear from you. Please send your comments, requests, or donations to kad-esh.org or mail to Kadesh Map Ministries 52 Tuscan Way, Suite 202-412, St. Augustine, Florida, 32092, USA. Have a blessed week, and join us again for the next Bible School on Wheels. Shalom.